All right. So we're back again, obviously. And, you know, Don, I thought today we could talk a little bit about metabolism. And the reason is, is everybody says, oh, you know, my metabolism is so slow or this diet slowed my metabolism or this food made my metabolism slower. And it's really just kind of this catch all term when people talk about metabolism. And metabolism, aside from being a whole bunch of words that are really hard to pronounce and spell, by the way, actually really relates to almost all the processes of the body, right? Arguably all the processes of the body. Yeah. I mean, metabolism is my sort of what got me into nutrition. I love biochemistry and metabolism. And, you know, I think in in the, the biggest sense of the word, metabolism is the process of taking all of the food, the nutrients we consume, and transforming those into everything we need in the body, mm -hmm. whether it's energy or whether it's uh, cell, you know, new cell structures or proteins or hormones or enzymes, you know, everything that we need, we have to make, and we do it from food. And that's really what metabolism is. So metabolism is actually taking one form of energy and changing it into another form of energy for various purposes. So it's yeah. differentiated as it relates to the different purposes in the body. And the form of energy that affects, quote, affects our metabolism would be really the macronutrients. Um, actually, and I haven't even thought about it, but also the micronutrients, largely all the substances in the body that we ingest may affect metabolism. Yeah. I I mean, I think when the general public hears the word metabolism, what they've been seeing on advertisements and things relate to the macronutrients, protein, carbohydrate, and fat. But you're exactly right. Metabolism takes every nutrient that we get out of food, whether it's a, whether it's a vitamin, which we call coenzymes, or whether it's a mineral, which we call cofactors, and they make all the enzymes work, which allows us to produce everything in the body. So, you know, I think when the public hears about it, they sort of zoom in on, on the macronutrients, but as a nutritionist, we sort of think about metabolism encompasses everything. Right. So when you think about eating for metabolism or perhaps carbohydrates would be a great place to start as it relates to carbohydrate metabolism. Yeah. You know, I think the, I think what people can't really appreciate is when we think about our requirements for macronutrients, um, as we've said before, we have no absolute requirement for carbohydrates. We have an absolute requirement for protein, mm -hmm. but that's really only for the essential amino acids. And if you add that up, that's only about 35 grams. And 35 grams we have an absolute of... requirement for of, of essential amino acids. Okay. And, you know, essential amino acids make, in a, make up about 50% of total protein. So that would mean we'd have a, an RDA of about 50, of around 70 grams of protein. Right. So anyway, the point I want to make is that our absolute requirements about 35 grams of essential amino acids and about three grams of essential fatty acids. Mm -hmm. If you add those two up, they only account for about 170 calories per day. <laughs> and yet most yeah. people are eating 2,000 or more. So that means there's a huge discretionary choice of carbohydrates, fats, and protein to make us healthy. Mm. And that's where we kind of get into metabolism and you know what choices should we make? Right. And those choices are really important because as it relates to metabolism, really that energy partitioning, particularly carbohydrates, and we'll talk about this, the carbohydrate threshold, I think is a really important concept for people to understand because carbs are very palatable. So I think a natural segue of uh, metabolism, which is a partitioning of energy and the taking form of energy in the form, the chemical form of energy as it relates to food, primarily carbohydrates, and then really thinking about what is the carbohydrate threshold per meal, or how can we think about carbohydrates as it relates to something applicable to our nutrition? Yeah. You know, I like to build a concept of carbohydrate tolerance. I think one of the things that 
people need to understand is that the body can get calories from either carbohydrates or fats, um, but carbohydrates have the biggest metabolic influence. They're a very dominant uh, material, very dominant nutrient. And in fact, they're relatively toxic. We know because diabetes is a major disease. Um, we talk about fats, you know, causing obesity or having problems, but they're relatively not toxic and the body likes to use them. And so the, the issue is we start thinking about the individual fuels, we then have to start taking an individual tissue approach to it. Right. We know that the brain and the red blood cells want to use glucose. Um, the heart, on the other hand, uses almost exclusively fatty acids. Um, the pancreas uses almost exclusively glucose. The liver, actually the primary fuel in the liver is actually amino acids and fat and glucose is second. And then the big tissue, skeletal muscle, actually prefers using fatty acids, but actually is pretty good at using carbohydrates. So with all of that, you can then begin to construct kind of, well, what do you think the right balance ought to be? And the reality is it's kind of depends on who you are, what your goals are. So when you guys were building nutritional plans for individuals during your studies, how did you, how did you come up with those numbers? How did you do that? Uh, again, it depends a little on what individual, but let's, let's take an individual who's trying to control calories, somebody who's maybe overweight, like most adults, <laughs> and trying to control their body composition and calories. We always start with sort of the RDA for carbohydrates at 130 grams per day. Uh, and that's important to recognize because the average American's eating over 300. So this is like one right. third of what the average Americans are eating. Um, where did that number come from? Well, the RDA basically comes from what we call the obligatory glucose users. Like I said, the brain, red blood cell, kidney, pancreas. Um, they use around 80 grams of carbohydrate per day. And then they put in a couple of standard deviation safety factor and that comes up to the 130. So that's a pretty good diet that allows for five servings of vegetables and three servings of fruit and some whole grains. So that's pretty good. Again, Americans are eating three times that amount. Right. So as we sort of build it from there, we then begin to ask, well, what tissues are gonna use it? How much muscle metabolism is there? Uh, how much exercise do you do? Uh, what's your total energy need? And so we sort of start constructing it from that point. Okay. So what do you take? So you obviously control for calories and then you determine really their car. I think that we should talk about obligatory carbohydrate use and mm -hmm. how you determine a meal threshold. I think that that's really important. Yeah. Um, so we, we've kind of fallen into the trap of talking about nutritional requirements as daily requirements. You know, we have a certain need for vitamin C or B6 or something. We've also done that with protein and carbohydrates. And I think with the macronutrients, how we balance individual meals becomes critical. And so we know from all of the diabetes work that, you know, your fasting blood glucose, the peak after a meal and the two hour value are absolutely critical. We know that the two hour meal really determines your hemoglobin A1C values for most people. And that becomes critical to your glucose health, your glycemic regulation. And so we start, you know, we start looking at, at you know, that kind of a number at a meal. Um, so now we get back to that obligatory use. The brain uses glucose, brain and red blood cells use it at about four grams per hour. Right. And the other tissues of the body, liver, pancreas, use it at about two grams per hour. And muscle in a resting condition uses it somewhere between two and three, depending on the amount of muscle mass. So if you add those up, you get a number of about 10 grams per hour that you can use. And now we've got a two hour disposal window window after a meal, or we get into that glycemic problem. Right. So that gives you 20 grams that we can dispose of at a meal. 
At rest, non-exercising. So at rest, non-exercising. Non since, since most people don't exercise while they're eating, we'll assume it's at rest. Right. Right. <laughs> uh, and then you've got glycogen storage, mm -hmm. uh, which might account for another 20 grams maximum. So basically, we have a meal tolerance of about 40 grams. And when you get beyond that at a meal, you have to have new places to put it. You either have to force it into muscle exercise or right. you have to force it into fat, the nouveau lipid synthesis. And that's where we start getting into insulin problems. When you have to force it into places to get rid of it, right. now you've got a problem. So I like to think of constructing a diet around 40 grams of carbohydrate and then ask whether the person really can handle more because of their exercise. And then what about actually handling less? If, or handle less. Yeah, there are I mean, people it, who, yeah, who are already insulin insensitive. Right. So if you have someone who's already insulin insensitive or obese with type two diabetes, so then you have to, yeah, yeah. So then you have to start pushing it down. So it may right. be that many of those people can't tolerate more than fifteen or twenty grams at a meal. So those totally are totally agree, and that's actually what I see in clinical practice. Th those yeah. are the kinds of decisions you have to make, and it's meal by meal. We we find that people who have metabolic syndrome, you know, mm -hmm. elevated triglycerides, you have to get their total daily cal carbohydrates below 140. Okay. And if you translate that into three meals, you, you have to get their daily, say that again, your daily total carbohydrates have to be below 140. Right. And then you'll start. And then dropping. that's even arguably, that's even high. I know that we're working off the RDA. Yeah. And you said that we can't pick and choose data, although I'd like to, as it relates to carbohydrates. <laughs> um, that's probably high. Yeah. I mean, it you know. probably is, but again, these are, these are large clinical studies. So these are average data. And we, right. we know from our studies, we know from multiple studies that are in the literature that if carbohydrates per day get below 140, you'll see about a 30% drop in triglycerides. It, it's so consistent, in fact, that we actually use it as a biomarker for diet compliance. If we're teaching a low-carb diet, to somebody and their triglycerides don't drop by 30%, we know they're cheating. <laughs> and do you also do a follow-up? So there's that, there's that um, triglyceride kind of baseline for an individual. So if you lower their carbohydrates and they go through that honeymoon phase, which is probably around four weeks or so, do yeah. you retest them? So How we, you... we, have, we have retested out through 16 months. Wow. So we have gone a long way. So we've tested at four weeks, at six weeks, at eight weeks, at six months, at 12 months, at 16 months. So we've done a long way. And with carbohydrates and triglycerides, we know that if you get it down, it goes down and it stays there. Okay. Um, unlike cholesterol, if you lower cholesterol, you'll get this transient drop uh, that will that will last from four to six weeks, and then it'll come back to the genetic predisposition. Hmm. So cholesterol is very different than triglyceride. Triglycerides are driven by the amount of carbs in the diet and the amount of de novo lipid uh, uh, carb uh, fatty acid synthesis that goes on. Very interesting. Then you determine. So you do the carbohydrates. You determine the meal threshold. Then you determine the protein intake, or is that all? Is that set for everybody? So, so we actually do that opposite. We always start with a protein target. So, I think everyone who's designing their diets needs to decide first of all where are they going to get the protein in the right amounts. Mm -hmm. And that you might be a vegetarian, you might be a carnivore. I don't care which level you pick. But you have to pick that first, and that determines a lot of other things, like the amount of exercise you need, the type of exercise you need, your age, all of those things come into play. Once you determine your protein, then you can say, well, how much energy do I need? Right. And that energy gets partitioned between carbohydrate and fat, and now we get back to your point, well, who am I? What, what's my insulin sensitivity? How many carbs can I tolerate? And that then determines the rest of your diet, which is the fat part. Okay. That's, I mean, I think people are going to find that really useful. So just to recap, 
carbohydrates are based not on a 24 hour period, but really on a meal threshold. And that meal threshold is determined by an individual's carbohydrate tolerance, which is really related to their insulin sensitivity yeah. and likely their muscle mass. Yeah. And you don't want to go above 40 to 50 grams of carbohydrates because you will get this robust response, insulin response, and then also the partitioning of glucose. So getting glucose out of the bloodstream because of its right. cytotoxic nature. Right. So the, you know, the, the, the amount of carbohydrate you choose will ultimately be impacted by your own personal insulin sensitivity, mm -hmm. your level of exercise, your age. And so all of those come into play. And so if you're a person who is overweight and has some problems with triglycerides or insulin sensitivity, then you have to be super conscious of the carbohydrates. And just in terms of satiety, we find that if people balance that carbohydrate and protein ratio at about one to one right. or less uh, per meal, we find their satiety goes up greatly. Yeah. So I see that. Those, I see that too. That, in fact, that's what my Lion Protocol is based on, that yeah. one to one ratio. And it's a great starting point. So it's a one to one ratio of protein to carbohydrates as is an initial starting point. And really what that does is it helps with metabolic regulation because number one, it controls for calories, but it also controls macronutrients per meal, which is really key as it relates to subsequent metabolic responses to the body, yeah. in the body. And you, you, yeah. you see it in your clinical practice. We saw it in our research laboratory. That's the same protocol that, as you remember, we used in our research laboratory. And we, can, we have data that shows the higher satiety. We have data that shows the triglyceride effects. And, and all of those are published in, you know, yeah. in peer-reviewed journals.